Uh, let's get started. So, hello everyone. Um, good to see some familiar faces and some people I don't know as well. Um, my name is Jeff Lutzenberger. I'm a technical lead at uh, a, a healthcare software company located here in Bozeman called Pulsera. Um, I'm excited and honored to be here today to talk to you about uh, one of my passions, which is mobile development. Uh, at Pulsera, I lead the, uh, the iOS side of our mobile development there. We are a mobile first company um, uh, trying to change healthcare with a uh, communi health uh, communication platform uh, for uh, essentially acute care situations like heart attacks and strokes. Um, so for the next 45 minutes, we're going to talk about uh, a topic that, quite frankly, for me, is easy to talk about. I'm a little nervous talking about it because it's a, it's a broad uh, area. Um, there's a lot going on. SWIFT has changed a lot in the last several years. Um, but I'm going to do my best to sort of go through the, the history of SWIFT, show you some of the language constructs, um, talk about some gotchas that we've run into with Pulsera, converting from an Objective-C to a Swift, uh, Swift application. Um, and then conclude with maybe just talking a little bit about uh, Swift in our production environment and a little Q&A for you guys. Um, so first, some background. So does everybody hate this part of the talk? Yeah, I do. Um, when I started writing the slide, I, I, I realized how much I hate this part where people get to stand up here and tell you how awesome they are and talk about all their accolades. So without further ado, um, I was solely responsible for Oracle's $1.5 billion acquisition. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but that's a thing. Uh, I was, I'm responsible for Orkiva's tremendous growth, um, their success, and their, their recent IPO. And finally now, I'm single-handedly transforming the world. So, um, you're a team player. So, <laughs> So, none of that's true, but imagine, <laughs> just imagine how impressed you would all be if that were true. So anyways, um, my goal with this talk uh, is, is really to, like I said, give you, give you sort of a broad overview of SWIFT, um, hopefully inspire you, some of you to walk out of here today uh, wanting to try to pick up SWIFT and learn it. For those of you that have tried it, maybe you'll learn a few things from some of the mistakes we've made, uh, some of the many mistakes we've made. Uh, and if you don't want to use Swift, that's fine. You're just interested in languages. Hopefully, you leave here with a better appreciation for, for this language. It's, it's a pretty neat language. It's got a lot of really cool features. Um, so again, just a quick roadmap. We're going to talk about the history of Swift. We're going to go through um, interoperability, so how do you use Swift with Objective-C and vice versa. We'll go through a whole bunch of basic language features. And we'll, we'll talk about two important concepts in Swift, and that's reference versus value types and protocol-oriented programming, um, and sort of to, we'll talk through how the two are related. And at, at the end, I'm, I'm happy to open it up to Q&A. Uh, if for some reason we run out of time and you have questions, feel free to grab me after the talk at any time. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Yeah, so when Wes first asked me to give this talk, um, Initially, I was a little nervous um, because I kind of thought, well, well, what the heck am I going to say about Swift? Um, after all, at Pulsera, you know, we transitioned to, from a, a solely Objective-C based application to uh, a, an app that included some Swift. The migration was, was seamless. It was probably like the easiest thing I've ever done as far as like to do with interoperability. Um, the syntax of Swift, if you haven't seen it, it's very clean. Uh, it's a strongly typed language, which I really appreciate. Uh, and it's a very expressive language. And finally, it's not Objective-C. So how many people uh, have used Objective-C in the room? OK, right? Uh, how many people are using Swift right now? OK, cool. Well, you'll learn maybe something at the end of the, end of the talk, <laughs> I hope. Um, so, uh, so yeah, if you've seen Objective-C, um, if you, especially if you use it, you know it's just not a pretty language. It's not fun to look at. So when I started working at Pulsera, I inherited uh, an application that was all Objective-C based, um, manual memory management, uh, really no coding style uh, or conformance to any kind of coding style in, in, the, in the code base. And so the first thing I did uh, when I started at Pulsera was started, I kind of re-architected uh, the entire application 
introduced some coding styles, tried to clean things up and make it prettier. And it helped a little bit, but at the end of the day, uh, Objective-C is just, it's just not fun to, to look at, and it's really not the best language to use. Um, right, so, so what is Swift? Swift is an open source programming language introduced by Apple. Um, now I say it's, it's uh, uh, object oriented, but I think as Swift matures, there's really a move to say it's protocol oriented, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means later, later in the talk. Um, but it's, uh, it's a relatively new programming language um, built from the ground up, uh, expressly built for OS X, iOS, watchOS, and tvOS application development. Um, Apple has referred to Swift as an Objective C as Objective C without the C. I think they probably regret that now because uh, there's really very few similarities between Objective C and Swift, other than they're protocol oriented. Um, Objective C uses a thing called message passing, uh, which was adopted from from Smalltalk, I think, for dynamic dispatch. Uh, Swift uses a combination of V tables and and um, and message passing for its dynamic dispatch. Um, it's just it's just a completely different language, in my opinion, uh, other than the protocol aspect of it. Um, but nevertheless, um, Swift definitely feels like a modern programming language when you use it, um, and it appears to be gaining traction in the community rather rapidly, uh, especially in the last uh, year or so. So, real quick, just to get a better understanding of uh, of Swift. Um, yeah, I'm trying out notes this time. I didn't do this. This is whatever. Uh, yeah. Anyways, um, yeah. To get a better understanding of, of sort of Swift, um, we'll we'll take a brief look at its, at its uh, relatively short history. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting is how uh, Apple was able to to uh, to introduce uh, a new programming language into a mature uh, ecosystem. Um, with with uh, relatively little disruption, um, both to the community um, and to and to existing applications. Um, so in 2010, development began on uh, on Swift. Uh, it was started by a guy named Chris Latner, who was at the time best known for his work on LLVM. Um, he began work on that. Uh, a year later, oh, I should I should say, uh, let me back up here. Um, he. So he took uh, inspiration from a lot of modern programming languages for Swift, um, including Rust, Python, Ruby, C Sharp. Um, there's obviously some Objective C uh, inspiration there with the protocol-oriented programming, um, as I mentioned. In 2011, uh, Apple did a, a separate sort of uh, a separate project, sort of related to the rollout of Swift or the eventual rollout of Swift, called Arc. Arc is uh, Automatic reference counting, and it was uh, it was Apple's solution to uh, garbage collection in in uh, Objective C at the time. Um, prior to this, all memory management was had to be handled by the programmer uh, in Objective C applications, um, and so uh, Apple introduced Arc in 2011 to sort of uh, to to help developers out with that and and, uh, and start to do some automatic uh, uh, garbage collection. Then it's finally in September 2014, Swift re reached gold standard 1.0. Um, shortly after that, uh, Swift hits 1.2. Um, uh, yeah, so 1.2 uh, was was also sort of the first version that was was introduced to the community uh, as a as a semi mature language that could be used for application development. Um, this version included. Uh, Include some improvements over 1.0, including incremental builds, um, chain lets, which I'll, we'll talk about later, um, modifiers to up and down casts, and uh, also uh, at this time, uh, Apple introduced the Swift, Swift migration tool uh, uh, into, into Xcode to help developers uh, start consuming or using this new language. Um, then in June 2015, uh, Swift 2.0 was inter introduced, and to me, this really represented sort of a maturing of the language. Um, uh, uh, protocol extensions were added, which was a which was a nice thing. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, better better error handling was was also introduced. Um, a guard clause was introduced. Um, 
and a lot of things were deprecated. So I will say, like, um, we were on Swift 1.2 initially uh, at Pulsera. Swift 2.0 uh, took us about a couple of days to, to deal with all of the uh, deprecation warnings in Xcode. Um, but no unexpected, um, uh, nothing unexpected from, from sort of handling our, the deprecation warnings. Um, you know, I think everything went pretty smoothly for us with that. Um, and then in uh, December of 2015, um, and I should back up and mention that uh, when Swift 2.0 was released, um, I don't know if, for those of you that follow this, you probably know it, but but uh, Apple did release they were, or did um, mention that they were going to release uh, Swift as an open source or make it open source. Um, this happened in December 2015 with Swift 2.2. Uh, it was released under the Apache 2 license and is now uh, an open source project. Uh, at the same time, they they uh, they mentioned. Apple mentioned that they were there was they were beginning work on a package manager that hasn't been released yet. I don't know what the release date is for that, um, but it'll be exciting to to see what they do with that. Um, so before jumping into into the code, uh, I did want to take a minute and just talk a little bit about interoperability. So as I mentioned, I mean this was this was really key to getting developers to migrate over to uh, to Swift in their applications, obviously. Um, so it turns out that it's really quite easy to, to enable uh, Swift, to use Swift files in existing Objective-C uh, uh, projects. As long as automatic reference counting is enabled, there's just a few settings that you have to set or uh, you have to toggle in order to, to start using Swift in your uh, existing Objective-C code base. Um, one of them is uh, define modules. So you have to set define modules equal to yes. This is in your build settings. It's pretty easy to find. And the other one is you have to define both a bridging header and uh, an interface header name. Once you've done that, uh, you can start using Swift in in your in your code. Um, so, if you're coming if you're coming from a legacy code base and you're trying to, to utilize Swift um, in a legacy code base, the first thing you're probably going to want to do uh, is use uh, Objective C in Swift. So, this is how we approached it. Uh, we had a few new features that were coming out, so. All the new features were written in Swift, but we still had some old, old uh, reusable code written in Objective-C, like buttons and text fields and things like that, um, that we wanted to import into our Swift files. Doing that is relatively easy. All you do is go into your bridging header and just import any of the, uh, the header definitions for uh, your Objective-C classes. Xcode automatically builds the Swift interface for those, and you can use them in your Swift code seamlessly. Uh, if you want to go the other way, so import Swift into Objective-C, you don't have to do anything. Um, this is all done for you at compile time uh, in, your, in this what's called an interface header. The only issue is if you look at that interface header, it looks a little daunting, um, especially if you don't know Objective-C at all. But it's actually not that complicated. Um, there are just a few things here. There's a Swift class declaration, so there's some namespacing added to the, to the, uh, to the class. There's the standard Objective-C way to set up, um, set up a class and add some properties. So these are Boolean properties. And when you look at the underlying uh, Swift class, you can see there's really just a one-to-one -one mapping. We have a class. It's a patient-based view controller. Uh, it's derived from base view controller. There are a couple of properties. This one has a setter that does nothing, so, uh, so the automatically generated code didn't do anything with it. Um, but you can see it's a very simple, simple mapping. Fortunately, you don't really have to worry about that. Um, but occasionally, uh, I've found in Xcode, when I go to an object and click on go to definition, I'll end up in this file. And I'm like, what the heck is that? Um, but that's what it looks like. Um, but like I said, fortunately, it's done for you. OK. So now I'd like to, uh, like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the language features uh, in Swift. So for those of you that haven't seen, seen Swift or are new to Swift, um, but are coming from other languages, Ruby, Python, uh, C Sharp, whatever, um, any modern languages uh, or language, you'll see a lot of similarities with uh, any of the other uh, modern modern languages here. So real quick, I just want to go through some of the some of the sort of basics of the language. Um, and before I do that, I do want to mention that there is a playground in Xcode. So for those of you that are interested in playing with Swift, um, you can download Xcode, uh, launch the playground, and immediately start uh, start writing code in their, their version of a, of a REPL. 
Um, okay, so constants and variables. Swift obviously has a concept of constants and variables. Um, they're set as follows. So var is the variable, uh, is the keyword for variable. So here we have var number of beers equals zero. Um, let is the way that you define a constant. So we've got a let six pack, a let 12 pack, we've got all the beers. Uh, we've got a million over here with a nod to Ruby programmers with the underscores for more readability for the numbers. And then we've got another uh, let down here called pi 3.14159. So the thing to note here is uh, the compiler does type inferencing. So number of beers is set to zero. We didn't actually have to tell it that it's tell it that this variable is an integer. Uh, the compiler does that for us. So a couple things we can do, right? So we can set a constant value uh, to, to, to our variable number of beer, beers with uh, value semantics. We can reset that, very very straightforward, something you would expect to be able to do with language. Um, what you can't do, so uh, Swift is a typed language, so typing does matter. So you can't set pi equal to number of beers. You immediately get a compiler error saying cannot assign value of double to int. Um, we have to cast pi to an integer in order to set that equal to number of beers. The other thing you can't do is you can't obviously uh, assign a value to uh, uh, an immutable or constant, uh, constant variable or constant. Uh. Okay, so another cool thing that, that Swift has is a thing called uh, type annotations and uh, tuple assignment or change assignment. So um, here we. Here I'm just showing that we can, in fact, um, create a vari an uninitialized variable. When we do that, we do have to tell it that it's an int of type integer, so you have to give it a type. We can do a, a chain variable creation, so we can go var, IPA, comma, water, comma, pilsner, those all become ints. Um, if we try to access IPA, we get a compiler warnings or a compiler error telling us that IPA is used before it being initialized, um, which is expected. Uh, we could do this tuple assignment or uh, chain assignment, which is kind of cool. So you can go var IPA, comma, pilsner, comma, plot, or var pilsner, and set all the values equal to one. Type inferencing works there. We could just as easily have said uh, IPA is one, logger is string, and pilsner, pilsner is a class. Um, that works fine. Um, again, we can print IPA now because we've initialized it, and you can see it prints one. Uh, you can do reassignment with tuples, which is kind of cool. Um, so now we can reset everything to zero. We can print them out, and we see that uh, all the variables are zero. Booleans are really straightforward. Uh, here we've got a, a Boolean called beer run. We've got another integer called number of beers remaining. Um, this kind of thing works. If beer run, print beer run, so it prints out beer run. Um, so if you're coming from other languages, this might surprise you a bit. This was uh, deprecated in 2.0 and just removed from 2.2. Um, so, in other languages, you might be able to say that, well, in, in beers remaining is zero, and that evaluates to false. Uh, that was removed in Swift due to some ambiguities with optional types. So, the problem here is, and we'll get into, uh, into optional types here in, in a moment, but uh, the problem here is that we could have initialized in beers remaining as an optional integer value. What that means is that it could be nil or a value. And so, there's some ambiguity in checking here. When you say if in beers remaining, does that mean if it's not nil, or does that mean if it's not zero? So this this kind of uh, thing uh, that you know that occurred in 2.2 to me represents really like a maturing uh, of the language and really Swift starting to sort of have its own voice as far as you know uh, uh, the features of the language. Um, strings are pretty straightforward; they work just like uh, strings in other languages. Um, so here we've defined uh, a constant string literal, rogue dead guy. We've defined a variable string called another another beer called Rainier. Uh, strings works, you know, basically how you would expect them here. String interpolation looks like this. So we have a, a slash, and then in parentheses whatever your uh, your uh, uh, variable name is. So string interpolation would work there. String concatenation works, so we can add our both delicious to it. And then, of course, if we print out good beers, we get Rogue Dead Guy and Rainier are both delicious. So nothing really new there if you're coming from other languages. It's, again, just just really, to me, it's just just really demonstrating that, that, that it's a fully featured sort of API uh, in the standard library. Um, all this is, is sort of taking cue taking from other modern languages. Uh, some, some things you can't do, again, 
you know, favorite beers is a constant string literal. You can't assign another string to that or can concatenate to it. Um, you get this immediate compiler. Uh, you can access all the characters in a string. Pretty straightforward. So characters is an iterable. So anything you can do with the iterable, you can do with characters. We can loop over them all, print them out. We can count them, whatever we want to do there. Um, add them to a set. Uh, so uh, Swift apparently supports three main collection types, arrays, dictionaries, and sets. Uh, the array syntax is pretty straightforward here. Um, the one thing you will notice is we have bars equal, and we have to declare a type. So all arrays are typed in, uh, in, uh, in Swift. Um, this could also be a protocol, and I'll show you sort of what that means later on. Um, but if you're coming from Objective-C, you're probably used to using uh, NS array or NS mutable array, um, where you can have a homogeneous array of objects. Not the case in Swift. Um, Why you could use NS array here uh, in Swift due to the inter interoperability. If you're just using Swift, this is the way that you would define an array. Um, the array API is fully featured, so you can append to it. Uh, you can do some other cool things. Uh, initialize it with repeated values, which is kind of cool. So here I have a bar of whiskey string. I tell it I want the, I want the uh, array to be of size 3, and I want to initialize the array with a repeated value of Woodford. So doing that gives me an array that says Woodford, Woodford, Woodford. Um, array concatenation works as expected. Um, you can add two arrays together. So here we have bar, beer, and whiskeys. We add beer and whiskey, and if we print that out, we get bacon, maple, ale, uh, Woodford, Woodford, and Woodford. Um, you can access and assign a subset of arrays, or a subset of an array, which is kind of cool. So I can go beer and whiskey, use the range operator here, which is the three dots, so two dot 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 three, and reset elements two and three to Jack and four roses. So if I print it out, then I get bacon, maple, ale, Woodford, Jack, and four roses. Again, dictionaries are very similar. Uh, dictionaries have typed uh, keys and values. So you see up here, this is the syntax for creating a dictionary where the key is a string and the value is an integer. Um, we can assign a, a value to a given key uh, as shown here. We can clear the array with that syntax, which is kind of nice, or clear the dictionary. We can initialize a dictionary or assign a dictionary with a dictionary literal like this. So that's a nice, nice feature. And then, of course, we can iterate over the key value pairs the way you would in any other language. Uh, here we have beer and rating, and we print out the beer and the rating. rating. Um, some things that you can and cannot do. So I find, found this interesting. So beer rating PBR equals nil. So even though we didn't define int as an optional type, uh, the, com the compiler implicitly makes it an optional type so that you can nil out uh, a value in a key value pair. What you can't do is you obviously can't mix types in your dictionary. So if I say beer rating and I give it a key value of string, and then I try to set a value of, of type string, you get a, a compiler error. And it says, I cannot assign value of type string to value of type int question mark. So I didn't call that an int question mark up there, but the compiler made it an int question mark. So I, I just found that kind of interesting. That is the syntax for optional types, by the way. The question mark. Uh, yeah, so sets. Um, I won't get into too much detail here with sets. Uh, it, it's again fully featured API for sets. Um, you can do all the things you would expect. You can insert. You can union. Uh, the set gives you, you know, a, a unique uh, representation of the of elements that are added to the set. So I can, I can insert rogue dead guy. I can insert Rainier, I can insert rogue dead guy. I can iterate over a set. Uh, it is iterable. When I do that, it only prints out the unique values of that. So optional types. So this is this is something that really uh, bit us early on. Uh, we had a, a lot of optional types in our code where we wanted to initialize some things, but we wanted nil to mean well it hasn't been set yet or something uh, for for some for whatever reason. And so we really started using optional types a lot. It's it's a lot like a null pointer. Uh, in C, C and C++. Um, seemed like a good idea at the time. It turns out that optional types have this thing called forced unwrapping that really started to bite us. So just to work through an example, I'll show you. So here we're creating a, a struct called optional test. Uh, inside of it, 
there is a, a variable that is an optional integer. We can initialize this or create, create an uninitialized version of optional test called lowercase optional test. We can print this out, it prints nil. And then we can do this thing that's really bad called forced unwrapping. And forced unwrapping is a way to say this value is, a, is, is an optional type, but I know for sure that it's going to have a value assigned to it, and I just want to unwrap it and, and inspect and use the value or access the value. So, um, you know, when you first read through the documentation of Swift, and especially the early versions of Swift, um, there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of documentation about being careful with this. It is the one place in Swift where you can get your application to crash hard. So this does result in a no pointer exception, um, which is no bueno. Uh, so we had a ton of those when we first started us, uh, switching over to, to, to Swift. Um, and then we learned about this change optional unwrapping. So the way that you're supposed to do this, if a value can be nil, is with syntax that looks like this. So you say, if let t equals optional test question mark, so now we've got a question mark instead of the bang. So that says, try to do this, and if it fails, you know, I'll obviously don't execute what's inside the scope here. Uh, and then access.test. So this is how you do this safely. So we had to go back through our code and, and basically add a whole bunch of these if let statements all over the place. Um, and so, you know, I'm still on the fence as to whether or not, like I still haven't figured out when to use optional types and when to not use optional types uh, in Swift in particular. Um, I prefer not to use them, but I think there are cases where it makes sense, so we, they end up in our code. Um, so, and even better than that, so if you notice here, there is, there's a problem uh, here in that when you do unwrap something, you have to enclose it in this scope, right? So in order to access T, you have to you access it inside scope here. So what happens is, is you, you, you have one of these optional uh, types, you unwrap it, and then you end up with this really long sort of scoped uh, part of your code where you, really all you want to do is just access this and then, and then move on. Um, this is also a problem when you start having multiple optional unwrappings, um, which another syntax was introduced where you can actually uh, do this like a change, sort of like change assignment that I showed you earlier. You can do this uh, a change optional unwrapping as well. Um, so even better than that, in 2.0, I think, uh, the guard clause was introduced. So this is kind of cool. So what this does is it says, you know, let me try to unwrap this thing and let me use the value later on. If that doesn't work, let me do something here. So I can return, um, that shouldn't be capitalized. I can return, I can throw, I can continue, I can break. Um, I can do basically anything early uh, to, to sort of get around that whole, you know, closing things in a giant, in, in a giant uh, brackets uh, block. Um, so the alternative to this before God guard was actually introduced was you had to do something like this. You had to say, if let underscore optional test. So basically we're saying like, you know, like if we can unwrap this value, then that's good, we want to be able to do that, but we also want to be safe with our code. And so we say, well, if we can't, if we can't unwrap this, and we can put something like this at the top of a code block, if we can't unwrap it, return. So the guard just sort of short circuits that uh, and offers a, a convenience on, on, uh, on the, the bottom statement there. Within that guard statement, are you able to also set that constant T? Uh, no, no, because there's an else here. You see that else? Yeah, so I don't, I should, we could try it later. We could try it at the end of the talk. I don't think you can. Because um, I think in that case you would just go like, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm not sure about that. It's a good question. We'll, we'll try it later. Um, operators, so operators in Swift are pretty standard, um, with the exception of probably one. There's a ternary conditional operator uh, here. Very, very familiar to probably most of you. Um, there's a colon called a nil coalescing operator. So if we do have an optional type, which is favorite fear, um, the longhand for this would be favorite fear. If it's not nil, give me favorite fear. And you can see that we, um, 
we force unwrap it right there because we know it's not nil. Otherwise, we re return you know a different string. So this little double question mark thing does does that for you. So it's a nice little shorthand for that. Um, range operators. So the range operator is the triple dot here. So uh, in Swift 2.0, uh, 2.2 actually, C style for loops are deprecated. So probably in the next next release, uh, they'll be completely removed. So the way to to loop to do loop control in uh, in Swift is with the for in, um, and that's what a range the range operator looks like there. Um, there's also this thing called a half open range, not the prettiest syntax I've seen. Um, Basically, this is how you loop over uh, zero to n minus one beers uh, in the array, or, or in the loops. Uh, control flow. Um, control flow, again, pretty straightforward. Four n, uh, four i in one to five for four loops. Um, while loops will look similar to you, while some condition, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and then a do while loop is slightly different in that the, uh, the do has been replaced with repeat. And the reason for that is in 2.2, uh, a scoping operator was, was introduced. So if you just wanted to create some scope inside a function, you use that, you do that with do. Um, so in order to sort of eliminate some ambiguity, do was replaced with repeat in this repeat while statement. Switch statements, uh, pretty similar to what you've seen in other languages. Uh, you know. But one, one caveat or thing to note is switch statements don't implicitly fall through. So you don't need a break statement in your switch statement. It'll operate what's ever in the scope and then, and then exit. Um, again, a nod to, to more modern languages. You know, you can do uh, multiple matching. And you can also do uh, range matching uh, in switch statements for uh, anything that conforms to the interval type or range type. Um, Okay, so that's kind of kind of the boring part, uh, just learning about some of the syntax. So uh, real quick, I want to point out um, something that's really fundamental to, to Swift's design philosophy, and that is the strong preference for value type versus reference type. And for those of you new to language or coming to the language, this is com was completely lost on me. It's totally subtle. I don't think it was very well documented in, in early versions of Swift either. So in Swift, Class is a reference, and struct is a value type. So coming from other languages, I was like, well, I need this object-oriented sort of uh, design here. So what am I going to use, a struct or a class, right? If I'm coming from C and C++, I'm going to obviously prefer a class for most things. Um, so we did that, and now we have to go back and convert a whole bunch of stuff to struct. Um, and I'll explain why later. So let's do just a quick, uh, quick example here. Um, we'll have some fun since the last part was so dry. We'll, we'll create a brewery. Uh, and first we'll create a brewery using classes. And this will just demonstrate the, what I mean by the difference between reference semantics and value semantics in Swift. So we'll create a couple of objects. We'll create a, a class called beer. It's hashable so we can add it to a dictionary. Um, it's custom string convertible so it conforms to this thing called description, which means if I say print ha the hashable object, it will return uh, a pretty printed uh, a pretty uh, printed representation of the class. I can create a keg, again, custom string convertible. Uh, it has a, a keg has a beer and some other things. I think that's how many ounces are in the keg. I don't know, I just Googled it and didn't read the whole thing, but I'm guessing that's what it is. Uh, and then I have a description, which is, you know, we'll return a beer name, so we want to know what kind of beer is in the keg. <coughs> Um, and then finally, we have a brewery object. The brewery has an array of kegs. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it also has this other nice little function. So we didn't really go over what the function syntax looks like. But this is what it looks like. We have a function called unique beers. It returns a set of beers. Um, and then we just used a, a, a nice little uh, 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 method on, uh, on array that allows us to uh, do a mapping function to map all of the beers uh, in the kegs to, to the set so that we can return this, uh, unique, a unique set of beers. OK, so let's build our brewery with reference semantics. So here we say let brewery equals brewery. We create a beer. We create a keg. Uh, we go down to our beer. We initialize uh, the name. We call it a rogue dead guy. We add the beer to the keg. We add the keg to the brewery. 
and then we print out the, the kegs in the brewery. And we get one beer, which is Rogue Dead Guy. So now we take our beer, and we call it Sapporo. We add beer to, we add beer to a keg, we add a keg to the brewery, uh, and then we print it out, and look what happens. We have two Sapporos, right? So this isn't anything difficult to follow for most of you, I think. It's, uh, it's just what happens when beer is a reference and keg is a reference. We've changed the name in one place, uh, but it actually updates in two places because what we've copied into the array, the array is, their, is their reference twice into that array. Um, so that's, that's the behavior of class. There's no modifier that you add to class for that to happen. It just automatically is a reference, right? So we can solve this problem by using structs. And so structs allow us to use value type semantics. Um, and it's something that Swift relies heavily on in, as I'll show you later, in the standard library. Um, and there's really a strong preference for, uh, for types, uh, type semantics in, in Swift. So all we have to do is change class to struct. And now class, now this object is no longer a reference, um, but it's value type. So now we can do the same thing. We change this to a var because before we had a let, um, the let was just saying like, well, these the, the references, the values of the reference are not going to change, so those can be constant. These actually now become variables. Uh, we can say beer name equals rogue dead guy. We can add that beer to a keg. We can add that keg to uh, to the brewery. We can then take that beer and call it Sapporo, and then we can assign that to keg beer, and then we can add that keg to the brewery. And then, of course, we can print the unique beers. And now what we get is what kind of more like what we would have expected, which is Rogue, Dead Guy, and Sapporo. And so, obviously, there's a lot of copying going on here, right? Something that, uh, something that you have to do with your value semantics. So you're probably saying, like, well, that seems like a lot of copying. That seems uh, maybe not so performant. Um, so it turns out that, that Swift actually does a really intelligent thing called lazy copying. So the only time a copy of a value type object uh, gets, gets copied is when you mutate it. So it does a thing called copy on write that has uh, tremendous implications on the, on the performance of uh, when using uh, value types. So. so then you might say, well, we could just use ref reference semantics and we could do this, right? Which makes more sense. It's probably what all you guys would have done anyways. Um, and sure, that works. But the problem is, is that you know, and I think this is Swift's design philosophy. We use value type semantics all the time, right? So when we do this, A equals 1, B equals A, print B, we print 1, we would expect that. A equals 2, print B, right? What should it print? Should still print B. Still print 1, right? So really, that's no different than doing something like this, right? A equals a beer named PBR. B equals A, right? So now B is, is a PBR. Print B, we print it out, it prints out PBR. If we change the name to A, like we changed A equals to 2, right, to Rainier, we wouldn't expect B to change, right? And so I think that's one of the, the fundamental sort of uh, philosophies behind uh, Swift, um, in that Swift really encourages immutability, but allows for mutability. Right? So, and the reason that they do this, um, and, and this comes up uh, in a lot of different talks and a lot of documentation, is there's this idea of being able to better reason about your code. And so obviously the designers felt that, you know, immutability, state, all of these things are things that should be uh, minimized in code uh, to make your code more easy uh, to reason about. So just real quick, if you look at Swift standard library, just to, just to sort of uh, shine a better light on, on, on the preference for struct, uh, we can we can go ahead and grab uh, standard lib.swift for the use of class. It shows up four times. Uh, we can grab for enum. Enum show up eight times. And if we grab for struct, it shows up 84 times. So clearly, uh, there's a preference for value types in uh, in Swift. So uh, we got about five minutes. It looks like I'm going to really quick run through. Uh, one, one, another one of the sort of fundamental design philosophies of, of Swift, which is called protocol-oriented programming. Um, so why protocols in Swift? Well, for one reason, inheritance is limited to class. Um, I don't know why that, why that uh, decision was made. I'm sure it has something to do with class being uh, reference types. Struct, enum, and class can all perform to pro conform to protocols. 
which allows for essentially inheritance and multiple inheritance, or what what's going to look like multiple inheritance um, for all of all of those uh, objects. An amount remaining. Um, we can do this new thing that's really cool. We can actually extend a protocol and add a function so that anything that conforms to the beverage protocol gets this uh, this default implementation. Um, So that's kind of cool. And then any object that doesn't want to, uh, or any object that wants to override it can actually override this implementation. Um, so then we can create a, another thing called an alcoholic beverage. We can inherit from beverage, right? So now we have a, an alcoholic beverage that has something called ABV. So now alcoholic beverage it has uh, anything that, that conforms to alcoholic beverage must also conform to beverage. So that means any class you build has to have a name, a remaining, and a double. So for some of you, this looks like an interface in, object, or in, uh, in Go, um, or a virtual class, or an abstract class uh, in, in other languages. Um, so then we can go even further, and this is totally contrived. Obviously, we can create a protocol for beer uh, that now has a thing called style. Then we can create another protocol called whiskey uh, that is an alcoholic beverage, but it has proof in its small batch instead. So now we can actually define our structure. So we can define a microbrew that conforms to beer. And if we go back here, uh, you can see that beer is an alcoholic beverage. Alcoholic beverage is a beer, so it has to have a string, a remaining, an ABV, uh, and a style. And so that's what we've done here. Uh, we can also create something called a local whiskey. So now this is an object called a local whiskey. Uh, we could also create a keg from this, right? So it doesn't have to be a beer, it could be a keg. Both of those things, you know, a micro, a, a beer is kind of different than, a, or a microbrew is kind of different than a keg, but they're both beers, right? They both should conform to something, of, an object of type beer. Um, so we can do something like that here. We can do the same thing with whiskey, so you can have a barrel of whiskey. Um, and then as I mentioned, we can, uh, we can override uh, the, our protocol extension. So before we had a, 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 a protocol extension called drink uh, attached to beverage, and the code for that was you know if remaining greater than zero, decrement by ten. We can change this to one because like you know a keg is bigger than a than a uh, than a glass of beer or something. I don't know. Um, so that's kind of cool that we can override it. And then, of course, we can go ahead and instantiate these so we can create uh, objects, glass of beer, glass of whiskey, keg of beer, uh, and then a barrel of whiskey, right? So these are all different types, right? But let's say that we wanted to loop over these, right? So as I mentioned before, the strong typing in Swift, um, you know, arrays have to be typed. So I also mentioned that uh, arrays can be of some type of, of uh, protocol. So each one of these conforms to the beverage protocol. And so this allows us to add each of these. So this basically allows polymorphism uh, for, for our beverages array and allows us to add all of those to, to the array, still maintaining strong typing um, and being able to loop over those and do the same thing. So each of those conforms to this method called drink. So we can obviously loop over them uh, and, uh, yeah, and print out the names and the amount remaining of each, each one of those. Um, so that's kind of the basics of, uh, of protocol-oriented programming. Um, I'm like right at the time limit, but I'm happy to open it up for questions or pull up the, uh, the playground and try some stuff if you guys are interested in doing that. Um, thank you guys for your time um, and uh, for allowing me to, to be here talking about Swift and uh, personally learn a lot more about Swift. Um, yeah, so adding their lunches after this. So, you know, okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about Swift at Pulsera or what our Objective C looks like. I can pull it up and you guys can marvel at how ugly it is. <laughs> uh, whatever.